As far as announcements were campus concerned, as uh, Rich said, uh, when he said ginormous, I think this is the first camp that I've been to since I started going back in 2007, oh, 2005. Um, we had over 130 some odd kids, um, and so that went well. Um, our campers came back happy and healthy. Um, as far as comments that were made about our kids specifically, um, our kids were called some of the most um, both well-behaved, respectful, um, and engaged kids that were there. Um, yes, sir. Um, and that was across the board. Um, people were very impressed with how our kids represented both the church here and um, our community. Um, in terms of awards, because that was something that was um, that we bring up in the past. Um, as far as our campers, we had something new this year. We had instead of just a junior and counselor camper of the year, we had different cabins. Uh, for one of the girls' cabins, Miss Sophie Ellickson was um, the MVP for her cabin, and then the. Combined team of Caleb, Waylon, Colton, and Eli um, were the combined um, team of the MVPs for the oldest boys' cabin, as well as winning the sight unseen because um, that group of boys, um, it did not matter what was going on. Um, they were engaged in whether it be helping set up for games, helping serve in the kitchen. Um, they were the first ones there. They did not have to be asked. They volunteered. And so they gave up most of their free time helping to make sure that everybody else had an absolute blast with the games and the free time. Um, and so definitely give um, them their props when you see them. Um, as far as um, baptisms, to, to the best of my knowledge, um, there were four that happened while we were at camp. Um, and there was one specifically that me and Brother Brian would like to recognize as well as one other one. So Brother Brian? Yes, sir. Go on in, call Sophie and Bree. Miss Sophie and Miss Bree, would you all mind coming up here? So, uh, Bree, uh, it was two years ago at camp. Uh, the Bree got baptized late at night. Becky, I'm sure you remember posting on Facebook at like, you know, 1030 or whatever that you were on your way to High Springs. Uh, for whatever reason, two years ago, uh, did not. So I'm going to give you a certificate of baptism. This is your first 40-ish days because it's been a little bit longer than 40 days since you obeyed. But this is a good study to kind of help you. And then uh, in conjunction with our prison ministry, we have a, a Defending the Faith Study Bible, a beautiful Bible uh, that has your name in it, so we want to give you that. You're welcome. Now, Sophie. What's up? What's up? There we go. All right. Now, now I think it's kind of interesting. I mean, I know camp week is basically the same, but two years and only one day off from each other, the 13th and the 14th. So here is yours, without a two days of two year delay. This is your first 40 days, but you can study it with your sister if you like your sister well enough to study with her. <laughs> she'll have the same book as you. But notice I made yours with a yellow cover on the back and hers with a blue. So if in a distance, you don't know which one is which. Just remember your, yours is, actually this is golden rod. I think that's the technical term. Because I wouldn't give you something yellow because you got a heart of a line. So give you that and then you also have one and if you two don't like the color I picked for you you can change it but you can't change the inscription because it's permanently written in there <laughs> all right but again with your name and, and the commemoration of, of your baptism on behalf of the church we rejoice and we celebrate with y'all being baptized into Christ Amen. love you ladies Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, how great you are, wonderful in all your ways, merciful, just. 
We thank you, Father, for the blessings of this life that we enjoy. We thank you for the blessings of your Son. We thank you for the blessings of being in the body, for having that opportunity. We thank you for the blessing of being able to do your work and the fruit that's produced from that work. We thank you from the fruit produced from the Bible clan, camp and the, the work that Tyler does with the youth. We're thankful for the blessing of the fruit produced from Brian and his evangelism throughout the community. And we're thankful, Father, for the blessing of being able to help those in prison also obey the gospel, to turn a new leaf and follow you. So we're mindful of these, these blessings, and we thank you for them, and we thank you that we can be a contributor to them and be part of them. And we pray, Father, that you continue to open doors for us to continue to work as a congregation to help others come to you. And Father, we also pray for those who are on our prayer list, for those who are sick, dealing with an illness. We pray that you be with them, and not only them, but with those who oversee them, those who caretake for them, with the family members, the doctors. We just pray that you be with all of these people and bring them back to a point of health so that they can come back here and, and be with us. We pray for those who are dealing with the loss of loved ones. We pray for your comfort and your peace upon them and their family. We pray, Father, that you allow us to be a positive influence to all those around us, defending your word and doing so in a manner that convicts folks and helps them turn toward you. As we go through this worship service, we just pray that it's pleasing to you and that we empty our thoughts of all the things in the world and just focus on you. We love you and pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Number 867, 867, Canaan's Land. We'll sing the first, second, and last. <coughs> Let's sing. <coughs> to Canaan. Number 578, we will glorify. We'll sing all four. <clears throat> Let us sing. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah. Yeah. 
declared to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which I also you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain, for I delivered to you first of all which that I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he, will, he, will, he was buried, and that he was rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Amen. Amen. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong, they are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. song will be 904 if you want to mark that if you're singing that song but 904 and I invite you to stand with me we'll sing number 528 for the lesson I know that my redeemer lives we'll sing the first second last <clears throat> let us sing I know that my redeemer lives in ever prays for me I know citizenship was established while the old law and country still existed. And we looked at the principle that, you know, had the war gone the other way, George Washington wouldn't have been a good American. George Washington was only a good American because the war went well. But, you know, from the time that we say the Declaration of Independence till America was actually America was actually uh, about a five-year, six-year gap. Um, and so we, we looked at the fact that the lifetime of Jesus' ministry was the laying of the foundation while the old was still in place to get everyone ready for the new. And we have a term that we understand, and that is grandfathered in. You know, whenever someone has been in a profession or a field and they change the requirements, what do they say? They say, well, we're grandfathering everybody else, and now you're up to code, you're up to standard 
because we've grandfathered you in. And in any other area of life, people really don't have a problem with that. But somehow when it comes to the Bible, people are like, well, that doesn't make sense. Well, it makes sense 99 other things that you talk about. But for some reason, you know, people have a hard time with the scripture on that. Second lesson that was last week, we looked at the fact that a new law, it's how life functions. The change of systems included a new law. Not only that, but it included a new priesthood and an eternal high priest. That Jesus had to bring a new law. He had to establish a new priesthood. And that priesthood didn't finish its work until those nine days after his ascension. And we looked at that. And the new circumcision or baptism and the citizenship process. That when you and I are baptized into Christ, the Holy Spirit cuts our soul, as it were, with the, hand, with the circumcision made without hands. To the realm of the of the unseen, whether it's the holy angels or the or the demonic, they can see the circumcision of the heart that is there on the soul. They know whether you belong to God or not because it's visible to them. It's not a circumcision made with hands. And remember last week we talked about if it was a circumcision made with hands, that creates a problem because different categories of people, whether it was men or women, uh, rich or poor, wrong nationality. Not everybody was eligible for the old system. But this new one, this new one, not made with hands, is available to everyone. And then we looked at this other part, and that is there is a singular, singular national and social identity in the church, which is his body. That Christ could not put anybody in his body until he was there as the head. That Jesus' goal is that there is not a nationality of the church. I know we use terms like the American church or the black church or the white church or the African church. I love it how when we leave America, you know, it's just by continent, you know. The African church as though there's not all those countries in Africa, right? You say, no, but see, that, that's the problem. There isn't all these divisions in the church there's the church and the church is his body and that's the identity that we have and we touched briefly that it's founded in the body and in the blood and so today we're going to finish some of the some of these other points and then and then at the end i'm going to take one slide and i'm going to break it down where it should be just super duper easy now when we get to that last slide please don't say to me Brother Brian, how come you just didn't do that lesson? That slide is going to be super duper easy because of everything else that we've looked at. You're going to go, pow, this is as easy as can be. I don't know why we can't, why some people have a hard time with this. And so today we talk about the death of the testator. And if you've got your Bibles, I'm just going to actually read from 11 through 23, and then we'll go back and hit the high points. Hebrews 9, 11 through 23. It says, but Christ has come as a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, nor by the blood of bulls, of calves and goats, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean makes it holy to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause he is the mediator of, an, of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the First Testament, that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now I want you to read those clauses with me that by means of death those who are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance okay that it, it, there was no promise available of eternal inheritance until his death goes into effect for where a testament is there must also of necessity be the death of the testator for a testament is a force after men are dead otherwise there's no strength at all while the testator lives Whereupon neither the first was dedicated without blood. 
For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament, or this is the blood of the covenant which God has enjoined. Moreover, he sprinkled the blood of, on both, with both the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, which is the figure of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. Now we come to this, just a few things. Death rids transgression under the first system and makes available the promise of eternal inheritance. Prior to Jesus dying, eternal inheritance is not a possibility. It doesn't even exist. The offer of eternal inheritance as a promise of Jesus is written in his testament. But until he dies, it can't go into effect because his death satisfies the old and it abolishes it but he can't establish a new law and a new covenant on top of the old law and the old covenant until it's fulfilled until it's finished hence all those times he said you know it's it's it, you know i'm coming to fulfill i'm coming to fulfill today this scripture is fulfilled so once he fulfills that old he fulfills it in his death now it's no longer in force. And so what comes after, it can't come in until that death has taken place. It, but it cannot be probated and enacted until after his death. <clears throat> you know, that's what makes the uh, lesson of, of the prodigal son so important. The prodigal son basically came to his father and said, look, I can't wait for you to die for your will to give me my cut and it to be probated. So just give me my cut. I don't care about the will because you're not going to die anytime soon. And that upsets me. I want the money more. You say, no, that's, that's the heart of, you know, when, it, when he goes to his father and he says, father, give me my inheritance. Yeah, it sounds good when you read it all churchy like all the Please give me my inheritance now while you live so that I may go my way. It sounds good. But the Hebrew audience that heard him, they heard the son say, Dad, I can't wait until you're dead. I don't have time to wait for you to die and wait on your will. Give me my cup because you ain't dying quick enough for me, old man. That's how they heard it. And to the Jew that heard that, they were like, Whoa, what a bad son. All right? Because we know, you know, I, and having done this enough times now as a preacher, I don't care if you write down your will and say, I give everything to my second great niece, Hortense. Do everyone the favor and put it down somewhere on something. If that was so-and-so's favorite clock and you know it and you like them, then write it in the will to give it to them. So that their cousin who doesn't like them but doesn't care about the clock but doesn't want them to have what they like can't fight over it. Right? You say, oh, no, man, I've had, I don't even know how many different counseling sessions I've had with people. And I'm like, it's just stuff, brothers and sisters. Let it go. The person's dead. Let their stuff go. No, I want it. But they want it. I don't want them to have it. Is it sinful? Yes, it's called covetousness. Um, let it go. Let it go. You know? Because until you say, well, brother, there's a different option. I know the different option is while you're alive, give the stuff that you have extra stuff of to other people so that you can enjoy them enjoying it. You say, well, what if they sell it? Well, good. If they will, if they sell it while you're still alive, at least you know they sold it right after you died too. You know, it's a win-win. Okay. But we know this is how wills and testaments work. Till you die, it doesn't go in. And then it goes through a process of validation and enactment that we call probate. So the death of this testator, 
Can I tell you salvation in Jesus was not possible before his death? And we're going to see why. You could not be saved in Jesus before his death. Any method prior to his death, burial, and resurrection and the probating of that will and testament is not valid. This is what we looked at last week when Ephesians said, of the two he has made it one, reconciling both in his body. There used to be two ways, the Jewish way and everything else. Now he says there's only one way, in Christ, but it didn't come in until after his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And then as we've seen right here, applying blood. Now I want you just to grab a quick look while you got there and you're still open to Hebrews 9. Look at verse 12. It says, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place. All right? Verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ? All right? Verse 18, whereupon neither the first was dedicated without blood. Verse 20, saying this is the blood. Verse 22, almost all things are by the law purged without blood, purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Blood, blood, blood. The blood is the thing that binds. When we come to communion in a little bit, we're going to look at the body. The body took the punishment, and the body shows us the hope. A body was sown in dishonor and it was raised in glory. So when we take of the bread, we're remembering that he took all the punishment in his body for our sins. But the capstone of the punishment is that it was a life for life thing when you violate the word of God, when you violate the will of God. Adam and Eve committed high treason. They should have died. The first thing that died was whatever animal that the Lord made those skins for him from. Then you come into the new covenant and Hebrews 10. I mean, just look, I mean, while you're right there and you got Hebrews handy, look at Hebrews 10. Uh, uh, there we go. Verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under the testimony of two or three witnesses. So there's all this death penalty because the violation of a covenant requires the forfeiture of what you pledge. And since God was pledging a life and a way of life in the covenant, the violation of the covenant requires the forfeiture of the life of the one who breaks the covenant. And so Jesus Christ, when he offers his blood, and this this is one of those old phrases, Ronnie. This is one of those few times I'll agree with the phrase. The blood rolls both directions. His blood on the cross satisfies all of the people that didn't die. That God took in substitute the blood of bulls and goats instead of the lives of the people. Knowing that what? The perfect sacrifice was coming in Jesus. And so because Jesus was going to satisfy all the terms of the old covenant... He accepted that blood of bulls and goats when it was offered in faith. But from the sacrifice forward, you say, how does the blood of Christ? Let me ask you, for everyone who's been baptized, have you sinned since your baptism? Okay. Every time you take that communion, <laughs> fellowship, covenant reminder... You are reminding that you pledged your life to his in exchange for his life to yours. Now, what should be forfeit for our sins after entering into the covenant with Jesus? You say, well, what you're telling me is my life would be forfeit. That's right. But here's the grace of Jesus. Every time we take that blood, every time we drink that juice, which... which he says, this is my blood of the new covenant. He paid the penalty for our future violation of the new covenant in advance so that when we come together as the church, we remind ourselves of the shedding and the remission of sins in his blood 
that he already paid for all of our violations after he had already forgiven us in the past, he also paid for all of our violations in the future. The blood of his covenant. He forfeited himself then so that we don't have to forfeit ourselves now on this side of it. Because blood is what binds in testament and covenant. Because some of us remember the good old days. All right? Children, do not do anything Brother Brian is about to tell you about. You're not supposed to do that now. How many of you remember spitting in your hands and handshaking? Right? Now, to me, that was always the grosser of the two. Most of us had knives, and we made cuts in our hands, and we were blood brothers. And there you go. I appreciate that. What? What was wrong? Yeah, you're right. Ava, you're right. Right? You're, you're right about it. Okay? <clears throat> you know, why did contracts used to have to be signed in red ink? Because technically a contract, you would take a piece of, uh, you would prick your finger or something and you'd put your own blood in the inkwell. Therefore, your contract was signed with your blood saying, if I don't honor my contract, I forfeit my life. That's why so many contracts for so long, you had to sign them in red because it was symbolic of you pledging your own life and blood to the contract. And so this is all this stuff that's in there. All right? And so that blood gets applied. That blood gets applied. Jesus is our advocate. He is our attorney. But what it says there, verse 11 through 14, when you look back, it says that by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place. His blood was spilt here, but his blood was applied there. His blood was applied there. And then 23 through 25 that we already looked at. The heavenly things needed a better sacrifice. So the things on earth wasn't, weren't going to cut it. He entered in, and verse 24, but he's entered into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. This was not possible while he was here. This was not possible for the thief because he hadn't finished his work yet. So it was once for all time. They're in force, and everything prior is invalid. Now, now you say, are we about to get to the simple part? Yep, we're about to get to the simple part. I want you to flip back to Mark. We're going we're to flip a few, and, and Lord, Lord help me, my goal is to make this as easy peasy as I can. Mark 16. 15 and 16. Oh, yeah. While well, you're getting there. All right. So in America, in America, do we understand kings? No. No, we don't have kings. You said, who's that? That's actually Tsar Nicholas. He was the last Tsar. His, his cousin was Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, and his other cousin was King Edward of England. They were all three the grandsons of Queen Victoria. And they all looked like almost like triplets. That's how close the bloodlines were. But he was the most regal looking king that was actually king like, right? But we don't understand kings because this is America and we said, we don't want no kings no more. And we kicked the king out. But do we understand generals? Do we understand generals? That's how you go. I didn't know that was what George Washington's uniform looked like. It wasn't. But it was, it was humorous once. Since it was done, you know, I thought I'd grab it. Five-star general. Black Jack Pershing, Douglas MacArthur. Okay. Let me ask you something. If a general of all of the armies or the navies or whatever branch of the military, if the highest-ranking general says X, and maybe that X is paint the rocks white in front of my house on this base. Is that an essential and important command? I'm not asking whether or not you think the task itself is important. It is, is it an essential and an important command?
command. Then why would we, understanding that if that's the power a general can have, or a colonel, you know, most people will never meet a general or an admiral in their life. I don't know about you, Gene. Did you ever like the thought of ever seeing a colonel when you were very first starting out in your military walk, when you were a private? No one wants to see a colonel. You don't, why? Because you understand how authority works. And I would ask you, if we understand that's how it works in the military, why would we think that a command from the king of the universe, the lord of the universe, can be anything other than essential and mandatory? Whether we understand why the command is there or not, it's not our place to question the command. It's our job to obey it. And I want to give you this to contemplate. Mark 16, 6, 15 and 16. Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that does not believe shall be damned. Can I tell you that no one could have really believed the gospel? They could believe the gospel in concept, but they couldn't believe the gospel in reality till after his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And can I tell you that unless you believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, you can't be baptized into his death, his burial, and his resurrection. The belief of the fact of what he did is what motivates you to unite with it where he tells you and, and how it's explained. But someone will say to me, Brian, it doesn't say he that does not believe and is not baptized. <clears throat> He that goes to the store and gets food shall eat. He that does not go to the store shall not eat. Now, I know this doesn't apply to you, Brother Russell, because you can grow anything 12 months out of the year in your garden. I know that. But for the rest of us, must we go to the store in order to have something to eat? Now, he that goeth to the store and buyeth not food, he still won't eat either. But if I don't do the first, it's obvious I can't do the second. All right? But I have to believe in the gospel. And if you've got your bulletin, and I've got it even underlined, bolded, and italicized in the scripture reading that Caleb read for us. Look at what it says there. I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which you stand, by which you were saved, if you hold fast that word, which were the word of the gospel that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Now wait a second. Believed, you can believe the gospel in vain. Now he's going to tell us what it is. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. He delivered to them what he received. They received it. They stand in it. They're saved by it. And that's the gospel. And here's what the gospel is. That Christ died for our sins. He was buried. And he rose again the third day. No one prior to his resurrection could have believed in the gospel, let alone been baptized into it. It's not possible. Because the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. You say, then what about everybody who was baptized? Yeah, I know. What were they baptized? They were on that grandfathered system. They were under the old, just like all those people that became Americans once the British finally decided to sign the Treaty of Paris. Now all of a sudden they're Americans. So it was with them. But from his death, burial, and resurrection forward, this is what you must believe. This is what you must hope in. This is what is the foundation for everything. 2 Thessalonians 1 in verse 8. He's talking about the second coming of Jesus. And he starts out and he tells them back there in verse 6. He says, to those of you who are troubled, take comfort and rest with us in this. Knowing that the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven in flaming fire with his mighty angels, taking vengeance 
on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You cannot know God or you cannot obey the gospel. Well, how do I obey the gospel? If the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and if I believe it, then how do I obey being crucified, killed, and raised from the dead? Well, that would be Romans 6. And I want you to see that. Verses 3 and following. He says, don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that from this time on we should no longer serve sin. See, the thief on the cross couldn't have been saved like you and I are saved. Wasn't possible. Because Jesus hadn't died, been buried, and been raised. He couldn't have believed the gospel that you and I believe because it hadn't been declared yet. He believed as much as he could with what he had. And what Jesus said to him was, today you'll be with me in paradise. Everybody says, see, that means he went to heaven. No, it means he went to paradise. Paradise is the Abraham bosom, the good side of the realm of the dead. That was Jesus saying, you ain't going to hell today, son. You're going to go with me to paradise. And for three days, Jesus was in the realm of the dead. And on the third day, he rose again, conquering death, conquering the devil, conquering all of those things. And he was raised up with a glorious body, a body of resurrection, a body of hope, it was sown in a form that was so disfigured he didn't even look like himself. And it was raised in such glory that his apostles and others couldn't recognize him because it was so glorious. It confounded them. And then he spent 40 days explaining how all the scripture came together, pointed to him, and pointed to what had happened in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And then he told them, go out and preach this gospel. And whoever believes this gospel and is baptized into this gospel shall be saved. I can't be what never existed before it existed. I can only be what is now. And maybe you're here today and you're saying, man, some of this stuff, Brother Brown, was way over my head. But this, I kind of understand what you're saying. I've said the same thing two different ways. Low, middle, and high. You say, that's three. I know. That's just a test on mathematics. But I've said the same thing multiple different ways. But today, if you're here, today, if you believe that he died, was buried, and rose again, today, if you've never obeyed that, he doesn't, he doesn't need you to be nailed with physical nails and beaten to a pulp to die on a hot day on a roadside hanging from a cross no he made it so much easier he says that if you'll die in baptism with him that what he did on the cross he will transfer the full effect and benefit of what he did on the cross to you and that if you will sow your life in him in that symbolic death and be raised up he'll raise you up at the last day in full truth and in full glory that's the message that you have your hope in I can't speak for everyone else in times past. I can only tell you what it is today. We leave it in the Lord's hands about other people in other times and in other periods with whatever knowledge they did or didn't have. 